My name is Jillian. I'm with Pro Bono Net, in case you uh, didn't catch that before. And today's presentation is Beyond the Pro Bono Manual, Mobile-Centric Strategies to Engage and Support Volunteer Attorneys. Today, we've got a great group of presenters. Uh, my colleague, Mike Grunenwald from Pro Bono Net, Barbara Siegel joining us from the Volunteer Lawyers Project of the Boston Bar Association, and Jenny Singleton from Legal Services State Support Mid-Minnesota Legal Aid. And today's agenda, we are going to first explore why mobile, why, why having resources available for pro bono attorneys is important, and talk a little bit about that. And we're going to then go into a review of mobile tools that are have or are being developed in the legal tech community and talk a little bit about the development process for those of you who may be interested in taking on development of and creation of mobile resources for pro bonos and other considerations that you may want to think about in as you embark on this process or are in are interested in replicating uh, replicating any of what you see here today. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Mike to talk a little bit more about why mobile is important and walk us through some some slides to uh, to support this. Great, thanks, Jillian. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Mike Renewal. As Jillian said, I'm the program coordinator at Pro Bono Net. Uh, my primary focus is on the Pro Bono.net platform, which is a, a national platform of uh, state and partner uh, state partner sites around the country and in Canada to uh, help engage and support pro bono volunteers. Um, so we have uh, around, I believe, 26 uh, partner states and uh, around a dozen national partners. Uh, that we work with on uh, on websites that uh, help provide information to pro bono volunteers as well as uh, legal aid advocates and increasingly uh, the public. Uh, we're starting to see some uh, increased usage of our system for that purpose as well. So I want to talk a little bit about a process that has consumed my life for almost two years now. Uh, when I started with pro bono net in March of 2015, um, it was with the understanding that we were going to redesign the pro bono.net platform, which I was all on board for. Um, and so we had already begun the process of uh, applying for grants to move that forward. And uh, around, I believe it was in January of 2016, we started the process in earnest. So much of what I talk about today is going to be informed by that process uh, of the last nearly uh, two years of my life. Uh, starting with this really fundamental question about why should we care uh, about mobile at all. I'm guessing that a lot of you on this call already know the answer to this question, um, but if some of you are, you know, on the fence about whether it's worthwhile to try to create resources uh, that are mobile, mobile friendly uh, and, you know, whether it's actually going to be useful to your volunteers, um, I am here to tell you exactly why you should care and uh, why you should put forth the efforts to, uh, to provide resources for mobile devices. So a couple of general points before I get into uh, making the case. Um, one thing is just to distinguish between uh, mobile apps and mobile responsive websites. Um, mobile app, as I'm sure most of you know, is itself a program that is installed on a mobile device. And it is distributed to mobile devices by way of uh, some proprietary platform, be it the Google Play Store, the Apple Store, uh, the App Store, uh, where you actually go and download this to your specific device. Um, we want to talk specifically today about mobile responsive uh, tools rather than mobile apps. Um, Mobile responsive tools are uh, tools that people access by way of the internet, uh, but they are agnostic with regard to the device that they are viewed on. So if I go to a mobile responsive website using an iPhone or a, an Android phone or a Windows phone, 
a mobile responsive site is going to look more or less the same to me and behave more or less the same to me regardless of which device I'm using. And the reason for that is that the site has been created in such a way that it recognizes the device that you're using and changes its layout in order to accommodate the width and size of the device that you have in your hand. Um, there are some good reasons why we're going to emphasize mobile responsive over mobile apps. Uh, mobile apps are great, they're really cool, they can make use of a lot of deep functionality in devices, but they're also very expensive. Um, they're, and I should say they're expensive in a couple of different ways. They're expensive at the outset, because to develop a mobile app means you are creating a completely new piece of software. Now, you can create a mobile app that leverages a lot of content that already exists on your website by way of APIs uh, and other infrastructure pieces, but the app itself is a standalone entity. Um, and because of that, you have to have the resources to spin up a brand new piece of software which anybody who knows anything about software development knows this is a time-consuming and costly endeavor. Um, some folks that I've talked to in the community who have developed standalone mobile apps have told me that they upwards of $25,000 just for the startup cost. And that's not including what it takes then to update and keep current uh, with updates to mobile device operating systems uh, the app once you've created it. So you have a lot of upfront costs. Uh, you also have the, the ongoing cost of making sure that your app is compatible with uh, with the operating systems and the, uh, in, in the case of Apple, uh, meeting the compliance requirements that Apple has uh, before you can even put your app on their app store. Uh, so there are, there are a lot of barriers, particularly in the legal services community, for creating uh, you know, a, a, a standalone app. Uh, it's costly, it's time consuming, and it also requires that you provide even more attention to your web resources uh, than you might otherwise have to if you use a mobile responsive site. So, um, so just by way of contrast, a mobile responsive site isn't a standalone piece of software. Uh, it uses basically the same code that your current website uses, if it's only desktop friendly, but add some additional elements to it so that it can work on a mobile device and not just shrink down to where somebody has to pinch and pan and scan to find what they're looking for. So our emphasis and, and the reason that we went the direction of making the pro bono net platform mobile responsive rather than creating a separate app had a lot to do with those kinds of considerations. Um, we also heard, and this again goes more to the general question of why, why is mobile important, we've heard a lot of feedback from users over the years uh, that you know, we need more tools for lawyers uh, who are using mobile devices. I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, this isn't just anecdotal. Um, there is very strong evidence that uh, people in the legal community are increasingly becoming reliant on mobile devices, much like the rest of uh, the rest of the internet using world has become dependent on those devices. So there's an expectation generally among volunteers uh, where we've heard when they come on board with an organization, uh, they expect that there will be resources that they can access on their phones, uh, on their tablets that are going to just work. And that's what everybody expects. It's just going to work. And it doesn't matter where I access the content, I should be able to use it more or less the same way. And it should be easy for me to use and I shouldn't have to go through any contortions in order to actually access it. So this I think is an important piece of, of the puzzle and then moving on to maybe a little bit more specific evidence for why this, uh, the move towards mobile is important. Um, in 2017, the, the ABA released uh, the results of their legal technology survey and found that 70% of the respondents, uh, lawyers, use smartphones in their work. And this, this doesn't represent, I think there is nearly 90% who said that they, uh, those who use smartphones also use them at home. 
they're they're constantly working, which isn't necessarily a good thing, but they they are, they want to be constantly able to access the resources that support their work. 25% um, report using a tablet as part of their work, so that number is starting to creep up slowly. Uh, but smartphones still by far outstrip uh, uh, tablet use. And then, as you would expect, laptops and desktops are still extremely important for uh, for legal work. But it's really telling that smartphones account for the highest percentage of uh, of use among lawyers. Um, so this this really makes it important for us to meet our users where they are. Um, if we put content out there and it's not in a, in a format that can easily be consumed by the people that we want to volunteer for us, we're creating an obstacle for them. Uh, they may volunteer once, but if they're frustrated by the support that we provide by way of our technology resources, they may not volunteer again. So it's important to keep that in mind and make sure that we're putting things out there that our volunteers can actually consume. So digging into this a little bit further, uh, among that 70% of folks who uh, in, in the legal community who are using smartphones as part of their work, um, there's a breakdown of the types of device. And I actually wanted to rotate this uh, so that it looked like Pac-Man devouring uh, the other operating systems. But iPhone accounts currently for 73% of the respondents who use smartphones as part of their work. Uh, Android has a respectable segment, uh, and it means that we can't ignore Android, uh, which I think goes back to that original question about, you know, should we do apps or should we do mobile responsive sites? The fact that you have two prominent operating systems competing, Android and iOS on iPhone, means that if you create an app, you're going to have to create it to work on both of those systems. So, you know, we're back kind of in into the late 80s, 90s, where you've got two operating systems competing and the software they create for one doesn't work for the other. Uh, we're kind of back in that scenario um, where iPhones, although they hold the vast majority of the market share, that doesn't account for all of the possible users and nearly a quarter of lawyers are using Android phones. So a mobile responsive site is going to work regardless of whether they're on an iPhone or an Android uh, because that's just the nature of it. They're accessing it through a browser. They don't have to load an application onto their system. Um, BlackBerry's still holding on, surprisingly, among lawyers. Um, I imagine there's probably a generation gap in there somewhere. Um, based on the lawyers that I've interacted with, uh, I kind of know who's more likely to use Blackberries and not. Uh, and Windows Phone still has some inherence, but uh, certainly uh, I have a feeling, uh, based on what we've seen over the past couple of years, that Windows Phone is probably going to go the way of the dodo uh, before too long. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. Um, so in, in addition then to the types of smartphones, it's also important to look at the types of tablets. I mean, I did note that, you know, 25%, roughly 25% of the of respondents to the tech survey said that they use tablets. Um, and unsurprisingly, among that group, 84% are using iPads. So again, though, Android accounts for 10%. So we have to make sure that the content we put out there isn't just friendly to iPads, but also works on Android devices as well, uh, smartphones and tablets. And the thing to remember about Android devices is that there are so many variations of them. It, it's just hard to keep track. Um, whereas with Apple devices, although with the recent release of three different versions of the iPhone, uh, this is becoming less true, but there's generally a more centralized uh, ecosystem of devices. So um, that's helpful in the sense that when you create mobile responsive content, uh, you can you know, pinpoint where to test it. Um, but for Android, it's much more difficult because you have so many different versions, so many different sizes. Um, so it, it makes it all the more important to have something that can adjust according to the device that's viewing the content rather than making it a particularly native thing to a particular system. And lastly, I hope just to put the icing on the cake, uh, Google sayeth the following. Uh, if you haven't made your website mobile friendly, you should. 
and the emphasis was in the original on their website. Uh, the majority of the users come to your site, they are likely to be using a mobile device. It's just a simple fact of life. Uh, and then further on, and I'll explain a little bit more about this, uh, they also say that responsive design is Google's recommended design pattern. Now here, they are talking specifically about websites, so this doesn't really go to the argument about apps versus web res mobile responsive websites. But the context for this is that in 2015, Google announced uh, in one of their proclamations about search engine results that they would start penalizing websites who were not deemed to be mobile friendly uh, in their search engine results. And I believe at the time this was, and it may still be limited to searches that are run on mobile devices, but if the majority of your users are trying to find you by way of a mobile device, and the vast majority of searches anymore on Google are run through mobile devices, I think it's upwards of 90%, uh, and it's an astronomically high number uh, of searches that are actually being run on mobile versus uh, desktop formats, um, they are going to ding you and actually reduce your ranking in their search engine results if they deem, and they meaning Google, deem that your site is not mobile responsive. So I recommend that you have a look at uh, Google's mobile responsiveness uh, site, and I'll throw the link into their, uh, sorry, the link to their site in the chat, so you all can have a look at that if you haven't seen it. Um, but it was really, it's a really illuminating and helpful. Thankfully, Google is, not, you know, they are, uh, they don't rule with an iron fist all the time. So um, if anybody from Google is on this call, I do apologize. I'm, don't mean to dump on you, but uh, I mean Google does control you know a lot of the the content or a lot of the traffic that uh, goes out on the web these days. So so here's the link to that site. Have a look at it. Uh, it'll give you a better understanding of what they mean when they talk about uh, mobile responsiveness and the principles that one should follow in order to maximize your search engine results uh, by way of mobile searches. So um, I hope that that gives you a, some context for why this is an important discussion and also helps set the stage for understanding um, you know, why we went the direction we did uh, in developing these websites to be mobile responsive versus uh, mobile apps. So um, I'll pause for just a minute if there are any questions, um, but if not, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll launch into talking a bit more specifically about the project that we undertook. No questions at this point. Really great okay. point on going uh, mobile first for design. Yeah. That piece of it is, uh, I think, the hallmark of the work that we've done over the last several uh, dozen or more months uh, was really rethinking uh, what our website was and what our tools were from a mobile first mentality um, and, and building them so that, you know, if, if they work well on desktop, that's fine, but it's more important that we are able to optimize uh, the way that things work on mobile because it presents so many different challenges from desktop. So yes, definitely if, if you walk away from this presentation with, with a, a, you know, a mantra, mobile first from here on out uh, because you have, so much at stake in terms of your volunteers uh, and getting access to content. And, you know, you probably know this, but I want to remind you that your volunteers have little patience for things that don't help them and that are difficult to use. So they have little patience in general because they have little time, um, but that just makes it more important for us to, to make these things available in a mobile friendly format. So, uh, since there aren't any questions, I'll just uh, move on and talk a bit about the specific project that we, uh, we've been working on at Pro Bono Net. Um, this was um, under the... I just pop in and say one thing, too. Um, and when oh. we do say mobile first, we're talking about not only the design element, but the content itself that's being developed. And Jenny and Barbara can speak to this a little bit more later on, but thinking through... Um, thinking through, we, we've partnered with them on not only the design, but 
they really brought a lot to the actual content itself that was being developed. And one last thing I'll say is that uh, we find that when you're developing content that's mobile, uh, mobile first, it and when we say mobile first, we'll, t we'll talk about some of those principles, but it actually has the added benefit too of um, being a little bit easier to access from a usability and an accessibility standpoint. So that's just a couple other um, reasons why you may want to consider uh, uh, developing around this mobile first uh, design principle. Right, so, Mike, yeah, I'll turn Oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you for mentioning that because I don't want to give the impression that a mobile responsive site is simply flip a switch and everything that you have on your site will just work beautifully on mobile. Um, there, there are certain things that you do need to stay away from, and I'll try to, to mention those as we go along, uh, but they go to that, that idea that if you want things to work on mobile, uh, you do have to create content in a way that works on mobile. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. That's, that's a very important point. Um, so, so just to give a little background on the project that I want to talk about now, uh, there were three different projects going on simultaneously that made this possible. Uh, one was a, an IOLA grant in New York that uh, centered on redesigning the Pro Bono Net New York site. Uh, there was a TIG in Minnesota with, uh, with state support. Uh, that Jenny's going to be talking about to redesign the Pro Justice Minnesota site as well as uh, several of the features, uh, again, to optimize it for mobile. And then uh, the third, but certainly not the least important, is the, um, the TIG with the Volunteer Lawyers Project of Boston Bar uh, that Barbara partnered with us on uh, to redesign the uh, vltnet.org site, which is part of the Pro Bono Net Network as well as the mathprobono.org site, which is also part of uh, the Pro Bono Net Network. But that gave us the opportunity, because we have these three grants all happening at the same time, gave us the opportunity to take a look at just about every aspect of our system. And because the emphasis in all of the grants was on mobile optimization, I, we were able to really focus on making the end user experience on Pro Bono Net uh, work as well as it can on a mobile device. So what you're seeing here on this screen is just uh, a design mock-up of the, uh, the standard home page for a pro bono net site. And I'm not going to get into too much detail on these because I certainly want uh, Barbara and Jenny to have plenty of time to talk about their work. But I just want you to get a sense of uh, how these things go from being uh, desktop to mobile. So Jillian, if you click through this, this just shows a few of the features. There, there's a pop-up that shows up when people first visit the site to find out if they need legal help um, because we found from a lot of feedback that people come to our sites uh, thinking that they are legal information sites when they're not. Um, but we added some additional elements too to simplify navigation and uh, give our admins more control over the information that they put right in front of their users when they hit the, hit the home page, sorry. Um, but the reason that this is a mobile first design is because these tabs you see here and these menus, these were all designed with the thought that uh, these have to be able to work on a mobile device first. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that whatever we build here is going to, uh, you know, not just shrink down, but also uh, be effective and present effectively on a mobile device. So this is what the standard homepage looks like on a mobile device. And a lot of things changed, but the underlying code didn't change. I mean, the HTML changes, the structure, uh, sorry, the HTML doesn't change, the structure of the page doesn't change, but what changes are the rules that define how the page should be formatted. So if you've ever heard of CSS or cascading style sheets, that's what I'm talking about here. Um, this, these are the rules that say this is what the page should look like, this is where things should live. So the navigation bar becomes uh, a hamburger menu, which is just the, the term for uh, an expandable uh, navigation menu, and each of those drop-downs that, that we showed become expandable menus within uh, that navigation menu. So it's not just, you know, let's force this into a mobile device, but let's make it a mobile, you know, mobile functionality so that people will, will know where to look. Um, and hamburger menus are, are very common on mobile responsive sites. 
Uh, so we, you know, we chose that format because we figured that most users would know where to go. Uh, we, you know, this is still new, and we'll find out uh, after we've had a chance to see, you know, how the sites perform and get feedback from users because we're still kind of early on in the rollout process. But that was the uh, the idea was to make this really easy and seamless on a mobile device. In addition, and I don't think it's shown in the slide, uh, the tabs that were uh, displayed horizontally become vertical expandable sections on that page. So instead of uh, clicking from left to right or right to left, they actually expand up and down to, to show the content uh, appropriate on a, on a mobile device. And all of the other content then stacks vertically so that it works nicely in a smaller screen. Um, but one thing we stayed away from, and th this goes back to Jillian's point about the content, <clears throat> we wanted to stay away from really big images. I mean, there certainly we wanted some imagery on the, on the sites. Um, but one thing about mobile is that big images don't work well on mobile. And so, you know, the images we have chosen, we've tried to keep them scaled properly uh, so that they do still provide some visual flair uh, to the mobile view. But generally speaking, you know, if you get much bigger than this, you, your users aren't really getting much value out of it. Um, so, you know, I think different sites are going to make different choices about how they want their images to show. Um, but that was a deliberate choice, was to keep that stuff relatively small. And then you see that's reflected in the desktop view as well. Um, the desktop view doesn't have a huge banner image. It has basically a scaled image uh, that very similar to what you see on the mobile device. Um, the other thing to note, uh, actually, I'll, I'll note that later. Um, but I want to keep things moving. So if we if we move, oh, it looks like is there a question? Sorry, I thought I saw something in the chat. Okay, great. Um, not not a question, but I will uh, I'll try to move along a little faster. Um, we also redesigned what are called the practice area templates, and uh, this is something kind of peculiar to the ProbonoNet platform where we have umbrella sites and then we have subsites. And but we followed the same idea. We stayed away from big images. We made elements that could scale properly and work quickly uh, on the uh, on mobile devices, but followed many of the same principles. So the hamburger menu for navigation um, made sure that the elements were able to stack vertically, uh, all of that sort of thing. So uh, moving right along, then, uh, and I'm really going to speed through these because I, again, want to make sure I leave enough time. Um, just want you to get a sense of how big this was, how big this project was. Uh, it wasn't just changing the home page to make it mobile optimized. Uh, we changed most of, I, I think maybe there was one tool that we didn't take a hard look at for mobile because it just wasn't in the scope of our grant. Um, but each, the calendar, the library, our pro bono opportunities guide, our case placement projects, news, guides and checklists that Jenny I think is going to talk about a little bit, um, all of those got redesigned so that they were mobile first. So I'll run through these pretty quickly. Um, our calendar became much more graphical rather than, than text-based uh, with drop-down menus, and those menus become sliders in mobile. Our calendar becomes uh, tappable uh, graphical interface in mobile. Uh, the events display in a single column uh, very cleanly in mobile. So again, just following all those same principles, um, that people are used to seeing sliders in mobile devices, um, and it actually allowed us to maximize the space. Uh, we couldn't fit filter menus effectively in a mobile device, um, but we needed to make sure that people still had that functionality. So uh, likewise with some of the other functional buttons in the calendar and subsequent tools. So our news tool got the same treatment. Uh, the filter menus uh, also became sliders uh, in mobile, and it looks like there isn't a shot of the mobile device. That's okay. Um, I think there is one of the, the library on the next slide. Um, our library got the most significant revamp to make it mobile responsive. Um, previously, our libraries depended on uh, individual pages with individual folders so that you loaded a new page after new page after new page to find what you were looking for. And now we've replaced that with a dynamic navigation system that expands and contracts 
uh, based on your interactions with, uh, with an expandable menu, and then the content updates on the right side of the screen. But to make this mobile first, we actually changed the, the format entirely so that instead of having that expandable tree, it actually becomes a vertically stacked set of expandable sections. So again, it, it follows the same principle. We still want people to be able to, follow, to find content quickly and be able to get there with minimum usage of data and you know, complete page refreshes. So we condensed it all into a single, uh, basically a single app within the website itself. Um, I, I don't want to take up a whole lot more time. I think I've, I've probably made many of the points that I need to make and I want to uh, step aside and let Jenny and Barbara talk a bit about their project. Um, Jillian, can you maybe just fast forward through these? I mean, the, uh, the Ops Guide, uh, the Projects and Cases tool all follow the same principles uh, of mobile first design, the guides and checklists, the same idea. Uh, things work, simply work well on mobile uh, whereas before they were just being you know, shrunk down. Um, and then we've also added a new feature that was, again, specifically, it was really the first tool that was built on our platform with this mobile-first mentality, and this is the, the toolkit. And this is just a collection of widgets that stack differently uh, based on the, the type of screen that you're looking at. So uh, this is the desktop view. In the mobile view, uh, the widgets all become vertical, and you navigate through them, not by refreshing pages or scrolling, but actually tapping on buttons that actually uh, dynamically change the content. So that was another one of the principles we tried to follow with, with the mobile first mentality was, um, you know, when you switch from a desktop view to a mobile view, everything becomes taller and longer. And that's not necessarily good news for, uh, for your users. Uh, one thing we know from a lot of research is that people don't scroll on, um, particularly on desktop screens. If, if something doesn't appear uh, very prominently above the fold, uh, above the, the bottom of the, the screen, more often than not, they won't look at it. Um, so in mobile, that becomes an even more significant problem uh, because pages can get so long. So it was real important to try to make things compact and make the interactions happen uh, right there in the screen without forcing users to go up and down to try to find things. It's, it's an art and we're still working on refining it, but it's just the idea of following that principle of you know, minimizing scroll uh, to make things more useful on mobile that you know, we're trying to uh, achieve. So I, I think it makes sense for me to step aside at this point. Um, I definitely want to hear, uh, you know, Jillian, I'll just pass it back to you. Uh, sure. To, to set up our, our other panelists. Sure. So um, before we get into talking about the process and other considerations, I'd like to turn it over to Jenny to actually show us their, what this looks like on their site. Um, what you'll notice is that there's a, a specific design for ProJustice MN, but the underlying functionality that we have here is the same. You'll be seeing a desktop view, but Jenny, if you could uh, just adjust the browser, we can easily see live what that looks like, um, how, how the responsiveness looks. So uh, Jenny, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to you now to walk us through um, walk us through the site and anything that you'd like to point out that's that's uh, relevant. So I'll go ahead and make you presenter now. Thanks, Jillian. Um, so you should be seeing what is the uh, newly designed Pro Justice website, like Jillian said. Um, and this is our desktop homepage. Uh, and before I get to the site walkthrough, um, I just wanted to um, talk about some of the the, um, without getting into too much process, just how we got to the point of redesigning our site. Um, so like Mike said, when he started at ProBonoNet, um, one of his big projects was, or his big project was redesigning um, the ProBonoNet flat platform so that it would be mobile responsive. Um, and when I started at State Support in Minnesota uh, in 2014, uh, we were 
just getting into the implementation phase of a project that we were calling um, Pro Bono to Go. And this was a tool on our advocate website, ProJusticeMN, um, that was meant to be a, uh, a tool that you could access, that volunteer attorneys could access on their mobile phones while they were uh, working in uh, clinics particularly um, or other settings where they wouldn't necessarily have access to a laptop or a desktop computer. Um, and so the content design, like Jillian was saying, was meant to be in the form of um, checklists and guides, so like basically bullet points, uh, so not a lot of text uh, so that it could be displayed well on a mobile device. And then the design of how we presented that content um, was meant to work specifically for mobile devices. Um, so the way that we implemented that design, um, which I think was something that a lot of uh, different organizations were doing during that time, was to create a separate URL, a separate site essentially, uh, to display that mobile content. So we had m.projusticemn.org. Uh, so a lot of sites, if you'll remember, used to do the main site would be, you know, ProJusticeMN, and then the mobile site would be M. Um, and we ran into a lot of problems with that, um, like I think a lot of other sites did. Um, and we, we had the same problem with our uh, Law Help MN site, which is our uh, public-facing site, where, uh, first of all, in terms of um, search optimization uh, and how Google uh, ag algorithms uh, rank uh, how they're going to display different websites. Uh, Mike touched on this, but if your site isn't mobile responsive, you get dings. Um, and then also, Google takes into account how many people are going to your site through organic Google searches. Um, and if you have two different websites, then you're splitting the people who are going to your website, and so you're not getting as many hits overall for your site. Um, so particularly with our public-facing site, we saw um, visits to our website drop when we created the separate mobile responsive website. Um, the other problem that we had was that we had uh, people accessing our m.projusticemn website for the um, settlement guides and checklists. Uh, so they would be looking at that, but then if they decided to go look for other information on ProJustice, uh, it was just an entirely different experience. It was literally going to a different website uh, where nothing was mobile responsive. It was a terrible user experience. Um, and it was just really hard to navigate if you wanted anything beyond the particular tool that we had made uh, for mobile users. So uh, soon after we released uh, this Pro Bono to Go tool, which is just the settlement guides and checklists, uh, we decided to make the entire site mobile responsive um, with uh, the help of Pro Bono Net. Uh, so that's the project I'm going to talk about. Um, and a lot of the features that you'll see are the same as what Mike previewed in the slides. Um, so our homepage um, has tabs, uh, which if you go to a mobile site, um, I've got just a mobile simulator up here. Um, like Mike said, it goes vertical rather than horizontal. So you can click between the tabs. Um, and then we've also got the hamburger menu to, um, to search around for uh, other resources on the site. When we were uh, working on uh, what tools we would redesign and how we would redesign the site, um, we looked at some analytics, which I think we'll talk about later. But one of the things that we saw was that um, some of our uh, resources that are in front of our password wall um, and that are more generally applicable uh, had uh, much higher rankings for how people how many people were getting to them uh, so the primary resource was um, our federal poverty guidelines um, which um, is something a resource that people would be uh, accessing uh, not just on their computers uh, you know a lot of uh, volunteer attorneys or legal aid attorneys who would be in uh, a clinic or some other setting where they were trying to quickly assess uh, income eligibility of clients um, were using this. Uh, and we were also linked to from our court's website and various other websites. So this is really where in Minnesota people are getting that information online. Um, and previously we had just tables, which is what it looks like um, on the screen right now, 
but if you were to go to this on a mobile device, which I haven't found a mobile simulator that will do this, um, but if you go to your uh, mobile device and look up projusticemn.org Fed Poverty Guidelines, um, we've made it a really neat responsive design where the left-hand column that refers to household size will freeze, and then with your finger you can scroll through the different federal poverty guideline percentages uh, to find the, um, the level that you're looking for. Um, so we wanted to make sure that this tool that people are already using a lot is, um, is user-friendly um, and is something that's easy to work with, which I think uh, makes people more inclined to want to use the other parts of the website. Um, so the other thing that I'll note is the checklist that I talked about earlier. Um, so when we looked at the site redesign, we added some additional functionality to our checklists and guides. And again, these are meant to be um, very brief primers on a particular area of law that um, an attorney who might not be as familiar with a particular area, so say a private attorney volunteering at a clinic, um, can get um, the basic issue spotting questions out there or collect all the information that they'll need um, to, um, to help the client with the case. Um, so previously it was just um, literally bullet points and now we've added functionality so that you can enter in information and that will stay. So um, what you're seeing on the screen now is um, an inter or a interview guide for student loans um, to figure out if there are um, issues there are ways to um, get some forgiveness. Um, so if you type in information um, here and then go to a different section, uh, so if we go to deferment and forbearance, um, then we can answer these questions and we have these checkboxes. And then if we were to go back to the initial screen, um, the information that we typed in is still available for people. Um, so not only did we work on making it look good on a mobile device, which I'll show you in just a minute, but we tried to make it more useful for attorneys based on feedback that we had. Um, once an attorney has finished um, one of the guides or checklists, then they can click the Save or Print button, and it'll cre create a PDF of um, all of the answers that they've typed in so that they have that for later. Um, so on a mobile device, you can see that, uh, again, the, the information and the content is stacked vertically. And again, we uh, try to keep um, all of the uh, text short so that um, it, it's not too much scrolling um, that the user has to do as they're going through the interview. Um, so what you're seeing now is a checklist, um, which is essentially the same as a guide, but we have these nice little check boxes. Uh, once the attorney finished, uh, this section, then they could click this box and that section is marked as complete and they can go on to the next section. And that's another nice way to make it a better user experience when you're on a phone is that um, these sections will automatically collapse so that you're not having to scroll all the way down to get to the next section. Um, so these are uh, some of the principles we try to apply, and of course, it's always a work in progress, so, um, so I'm sure that there will be, continue to be improvements and added functionality. Um, and I think the only other thing that I'll show is um, our case placement tool, which was a large focus of our, um, of our project. Let's see which screen it's on. So we use the case placement tool um, to allow legal aid organizations uh, to post cases that they aren't able to take, um, and then pro bono attorneys can log on to the website and view a list of cases that are available. And a lot of the work that we did on this tool was um, basic usability um, improvements, uh, and, and that goes, I think, that translates to making a better mobile experience in addition to just a better desktop experience. Um, so we uh, did some surveying of folks to find out what features um, they would like to see added and then use design elements um, 
such as this estimated time commitment and um, using color to call out uh, what opportunities are available for attorneys. Um, and again, tried to make sure that the information would look uh, just as good and would be just as usable on a mobile device. Um, so unless there's anything else that you guys would like me to address specifically, I think I'll um, turn it back over to Jillian for Barbara to speak a little bit about her project. Sure. So we do have a question from Laura who said, um, any suggestions for creating an ability to print documents when at a remote clinic location or when on a mobile device? We have clinics all over and I'd love for our pro bono attorneys to be able to print. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a great suggestion. I know that there are some, um, you know, wireless printers that you might be able to get, um, but I, I unfortunately don't have a good answer for that. Yeah, I, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but uh, what I've discovered um, with some of the more recent updates to the iOS operating system on the iPhone is uh, it's actually very easy anymore to connect uh, an iPhone to a not just a wireless printer, but it could be a printer that's hardwired into a wireless network. So um, definitely there are options available that are essentially out of the box uh, with, you know, with iOS. Um, you just would need to make sure that the printer, um, that you're able to, to set up the printer. And particularly in, in courts, I know generally speaking they uh, they, they're very protective of their networks, um, and so you definitely would want to work closely with court staff uh, to discover how you might be able to set that up. But, um, yeah, I would definitely look at that. I'm not sure what kind of options you would have as far as direct printing from, uh, from your mobile device to a printer. Um, someone, hopefully someone else knows more about that than I do, but... Um, you definitely have options out there, and I bet with a little bit of, of uh, research, we'd probably be able to find something pretty uh, turnkey for you. Great. Great question. So I think we can, um, and before I turn it over to talk a little bit more and hear input from Barbara and Jenny on the process, uh, Barbara, I, di I didn't know if there's anything that maybe you wanted to comment on just generally about um, your experience with um, um, uh, we're, we're going through the process right now of getting your site's mobile mobile updated as well as well. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so first, I just want to say that working with Mike was fabulous um, and that this is sort of a pep talk but that you don't have to be a techie to work on a tech project um, I mean I'm you know one of those accidental techies with no formal training um, you know I could say well you know it would be great if we could do this and do it this way and he would pause for a second and then he would have a great idea about how to do it so it's you know I think a, a, some people get daunted by the idea of working on a tech project but you know really you just you need to to have the ideas and then work with people who are really techies um, you know who can help you implement them um, other overall comment I would make is, um, you know, I think Mike alluded to this, when, you, when you're working on mobile design and turning a website into something that's, you know, mobile first and very accessible on mobile devices, it's, it's not just kind of converting your website into something else. You really, you have to think about it differently and I think um, mobile optimization really forces you to prioritize. Um, I would say that was one of the big takeaways for us is that, you know, it really, we really had to think and, and get feedback from our staff and our volunteers about 
what's the most important thing. Um, you know, I think as lawyers and, and people who work in, um, in human services, you know, we, we, we don't want to leave anything out. We want to give people, you know, all the information that they could possibly ever want. And it's, it's, not really, it's not really necessarily that useful to the user because it just gets overwhelming. Um, and it's just not possible um, on mobile. So it, it's really important to um, you know, figure out what's most important to you. Um, and then um, you know, just develop that. And it, it, I think that kind of discipline um, makes your content better as well um, because you really you know you have to be concise if you can say something in 10 words um, you know, it's it's better than saying it in 20 words and it's chances are it's going to be much more understandable so you know I think the the form really kind of influences the content in a, in a very good way um, but it's it's challenging um, it's challenging, especially, you know, for, for folks who work in the legal world. Um, the, the other thing I just want to touch on briefly is, you know, getting, how, how did we get feedback um, on what kind, what type of content we should focus on? Um, and I'm just going to talk about the guides and checklists a little bit. Um, you know, we, we started off surveying people and we didn't get a lot of useful information. We sort of got what we expected um, that, you know, the high priority areas were family law and housing and consumer law, which we kind of already knew. So we, we kind of moved into more of a, a discussion mode. So we, we had meetings with our staff attorneys and with our pro bono attorneys. We, our program is very pro bono oriented, so we have a small number of staff attorneys and then, you know, a thousand private lawyers on our pro bono panel. And so what really got us useful information was asking our staff attorneys, you know, what do people call you about? And what are those things that, you know, 10 people will call you about in a month that, you know, you wish you, you had something that you could point them to that would, <clears throat> that would be very easy to use. Um, and that, that was very fruitful. Um, you know, once people started thinking about it, they came up with a lot of, um, a lot of different uh, content subjects. Um, and we did a similar thing with our pro bono attorneys where we asked them, you know, if, if you were at a clinic, um, which we run many of those, or if you were meeting with a client for the first time, you know, what would you want to have at your fingertips? Um, and so that was a, a, a way to really focus people. And I, I think that back and forth, um, it is is really important um, because you can kind of drill down to to some of the specifics of what they're talking about. So I I um, I mean I love I love making surveys. I think it's fun, but for you know really helpful information for this type of project, um, I really recommend the, the kind of dialogue approach. That's I would say that's really helpful to hear that input because from our perspective um, when Mike was leading this what we do generally with tech projects and this was no different is you gather the initial feedback from partners and then you use that to incorporate ideas into an initial design and then you build the tools and then you you go back to the to you um, the the partner um, who hopefully is informed also by what's going on in the ground and refine that based on additional feedback um, and, and you continue to to do that but uh, you'll collect additional data either through surveys or analytics or um, doing usability testing 
generally that's how that works. Um, so that's that's helpful to hear a little bit more on on how you how you went about gathering that that important information to help guide guide this information. I'm not sure, Jenny, if there's anything from your experience uh, before we get into other considerations that you that you'd like to add. Yeah, we had a similar experience to Barbara where we had had done previous surveys. I think we had done like four surveys, user surveys of pro-justice within the past uh, several years. So rather than doing another survey that um, none of our surveys got very, very many um, uh, respondents despite offering enticing things like Target gift cards for $10. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so we went the same route as, as you kind of talked about, Barbara, and that we had one-on-one um, -on -one conversations with um, key users of the site. So um, we talked to several of the pro bono coordinators at big law firms and just like sat down with them at coffee. And then we also um, used one of our, we, we had two focus groups that were organized through um, our state bar association has a pro bono council um, that's made up of uh, the various players in the pro bono community on both the legal aid provider side and the pro bono side. Um, so we got, you know, uh, half of a couple of those meetings to um, have, you know, those in-person conversations with people um, and had some questions that we asked them and then had uh, a couple of worksheets for them to work through about um, where they would go to the site to find certain information and that when they would use a mobile device, those types of things. Um, but yeah, sitting down with people and having kind of a captive audience was how we were able to get our best information as well. Great, and I want to um, segue in um, as we, we round out about the hour to talk about some other considerations for undertaking a mobile project. Specifically, I was interested in talking a little bit more. In our experience, we've seen, um, I think there are two key aspects. One is developing a robust content strategy, so what you both were alluding to around um, around really looking at um, what's most important. So I think that that uh, encompasses the beginnings of a content strategy is identifying what's most important and prioritizing that on your site. And then uh, doing marketing and outreach to get the word out. Um, we found that you can build sites and you do get you know, depending on how you build it, you can um, optimize it for search engine, but um, there's also something to be said, I think, about getting the word out. Um, I'd be curious, Barbara or Jenny, if you had any comments on content strategy or doing marketing and outreach around your sites? I, I may defer to Jenny. We're, you know, within a, a few days of actually launching our site, so we've kind of held off on our, our marketing. Um, so we don't have a lot of feedback um, for this project. Um, you know, from when we first uh, created Mass Pro Bono, I, I, I can definitely say that it's really important just to get out there and let people know it. And, you know, you can never do too much. Um, you know, I'm, I, even with our office, you know, we we always find people who've never heard of us, and we think, how could they never have heard of us? We've been, you know, doing doing outreach, and we've been out there for 40 years. But you know, it's a big world, uh, in a big city, in a big state. So it's you you can't do too much. Yeah, and in Minnesota. Um we kind of did the traditional route where we um, had articles in the local kind of bar association magazines. Um, we were uh, had a little article in the um, October edition of our Bench and Bar magazine. We did news blasts, um, you know, with our own um, email list. And I should have mentioned earlier, but with the project, we were partnered with um, our state bar association. Uh, with a legal aid organization and with a pro bono organization. So they reached out to their networks. Um, we reached out to specific uh, sections within the State Bar Association. Um, and then I think the more unusual type of marketing we did was we um, 
had a webinar where we did a walkthrough of the new features of the website. Um, and my office uh, produces trainings for the legal aid community in Minnesota, so it was kind of in our wheelhouse already um, and pretty easy for us to set up. Um, but we got continuing legal education credit um, for the webinar. Um, so depending on your state's uh, uh, CLE rules, you might be able to do that. And then we offered the webinar for free. And I don't know if it was the fascinating content or the free CLE credit, but we got <laughs> over 60 people. <laughs> to I'm sure it was the content. The definitely, definitely. <laughs> but it was a nice way to um, to make sure that people within the network um, knew about the new site and knew about the um, updated tools. Um, and then it's also something nice that we have that recorded webinar that we can send out to other people um, mm -hmm. if anybody ever has questions about ProJustice, so kind of a nice little um, marketing thing that we have. Great, and I think I think one of the other, and this is coming on to our last our last uh, little little slide here, but um, one of the other considerations is how this. I think we've talked a lot about pro bono uh, your your website and making that mobile responsive, but how you can integrate that with other mobile efforts and other mobile tools that are going on. Um, I know that Barbara can speak a little bit to that, so Barbara, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you to talk a little bit about some of the other mobile initiatives and how you're integrating that with your, your website initiative. So let me um, go ahead and make you presenter, is that okay? Sure. Uh, all right, so I'm, I'm going to talk for just a minute about um, Mass Legal Answers Online, and I, I saw that the person who actually created this site and manages it is on the call, so Rochelle Hahn, I um, could probably do this better than I am, but I'll, I'll give it a shot here. Um, so you, you may have heard of this project that it started actually in Tennessee with a law firm um, and eventually got adopted by the ABA, but it's a pro bono website um, where people, uh, there is an income limit, people can uh, join, log on, post a question, the question shows up in a queue and um, then pro bono lawyers who are licensed to practice in the state um, can log on and take questions off the queue. And um, this, this site from the get-go, um, at least once the ABA took it over, um, was mobile friendly. So, um, you know, we've kind of pitched it as something that lawyers can do when they're sitting around in court or just, you know, have some downtime somewhere, um, it's, it's easy to log on and just answer questions um, right there from your phone or your tablet, whatever it is. Um, it's not a, a chat, so it's asynchronous, you know, you don't get, um, you're not back and forth right away, it all goes through the website, but um, you know, the, you, you can still do back and forth. There's just a little bit of a, a, a time lag between the questions and answers. And Rochelle just uh, gave us some statistics about uh, the site, which I'm going to put right here. Um, so it's been operating for about a year, and we had just a phenomenal number of, of questions. Um, most of which are getting answered. Um, in terms of subject matter, it's you know it's kind of the usual suspects. Although there there are some more surprising ones, um, like uh, our Department of Child and uh, Children and Families issues. Um, but you know we've we've got uh, hundred and over 170 lawyers who are taking questions. I think uh, similar to the experience in other states, uh, we, we've got 
a few kind of superstars who answer a lot of questions, um, but still have a, you know, a, a good, almost half of the people uh, who've signed up have answered questions. And just coming from a pro bono program, I know that's a really good percentage. <laughs> um, so that that's one of the really new and exciting tools, um, the mobile tools. And one of the ways we've integrated it um, with, with Mass Pro Bono is um, we publicize events. So uh, Mass Legal Answers Online has had some of these blitzes where lawyers get together um, and it, sometimes it's a group of law students with a, a lawyer who's kind of, you know, guiding them through the process, or it's newer lawyers and experienced lawyers, but where it's kind of a social event, so people come with their laptops and um, get on, you know, go online and try to take questions from the queue. Um, and so I, Rochelle came up with this title, Pizza and Pro Bono. We've this will be the, the second one of these at the Boston Bar Association. We've had them, you know, with other groups, um, groups of lawyers, groups of law students. Um, and so, you know, we would put this in the calendar on our, on our website and, um, and also just, uh, you know, soliciting volunteers that way as well. So, you know, I think all these web-based mobile friendly tools kind of feed off each other. Um, so that, that that's the main one I wanted to talk about. So with regard to free legal answers, um, what does the staff time look like in administering uh, the site and recruiting uh, volunteers, that type of stuff? Um, I <laughs> maybe Rochelle can chat and an put an answer in the chat box about that. Um, it's I, I think the overall thing is more time than you think it will. Um, but let's see if we can get that because our, our program doesn't doesn't run this. We we're kind of on the edges, just helping um, publicize it, um, letting our volunteers know about it. Um, a lot of our volunteers will take cases through us and do uh, free, mass free legal, legal answers online. Uh, it looks like Rochelle is responding with uh, seven to ten hours a week um, okay. in managing it. Great. And Rochelle, you're unmuted. If there's anything else you'd like to chime in on? Yeah, well. I think as I think probably other people on the call are running the programs too. I know Minnesota has a very successful one. I think it's very. Um, you know, you could do the basics in less time, but if you have more time to spend, then you'll get, you know, better answers, more attorney engagement. Um, you know, I think it's really, uh, it, it, it was originally advertised as being three hours a week, and that's that, and that hasn't been our experience. <laughs> <laughs> this is Jenny in Minnesota, um, and we, like Rochelle said, we have a, a program similar similar to that. We don't use the ABA platform, but we um, were on the Tennessee original platform and moved to um, our own Drupal site. Um, but the other staff attorney in my office, um, that's probably maybe half of her job. Um, wow. And she looks at all of the questions and she responds to any questions that haven't been answered after the time limit, which is kind of fuzzy, but usually around two weeks. If a question hasn't been taken, then she'll um, respond with either a resource from our law help site or a referral if a referral to like a legal aid program or something like that is appropriate. Um, so she spends quite a bit of time on it, but I think it, it varies. Like if you're not going to do a response to each question that doesn't get answered, then it would obviously take a lot less time, I think. Um, and I asked her just for the most recent stats. And they look pretty similar to Massachusetts. Um, in October, she said we had 128 questions, um, and that's a little bit lower than average. And we t typically have about a 50% um, response rate for questions. Um, and then 
when we re redesigned the site to go from the um, the Tennessee platform, which is what the ABA is based on, to our Drupal site, which was um, designed with the mobile first um, design concepts as well, we ha had a pretty significant uptick in questions asked um, because I think particularly clients are really accessing things from mobile devices, which I'm sure we all know, but um, we saw a really um, significant increase in questions. And why did you end up uh, going for um, building your own Drupal over using the ABAs? We wanted the ability to do more customization um, than we were going to be able to do through ABA. So ABA is definitely more cost effective, I think, definitely the um, cheaper solution. But we wanted to do some customizations that wouldn't have been available. And then um, as we redesign our Law Help site in a Drupal platform, um, in the future, we'd like to incorporate and integrate uh, legal advice online as well with that. So we thought that would be an easier um, integration if they were both Drupal sites. And does either your Drupal site or does the ABA site um, support uh, multilingual um, access? Our site does not right now, um, and that's, I think, kind of intentional because we just don't have the multilingual attorneys to answer questions um, who are signed up. Um, so if we had attorneys who spoke, uh, enough attorneys who were answering questions who could speak other languages, um, in Minnesota the main languages are Spanish, Hmong, and Somali, um, then I think we would look at that. The ABA is looking into translating the site into Spanish. But again, as um, Jenny said, it's the issue is not the questions coming in, it's the answers going out. Mm -hmm. We've got Nicole who um, mentions that uh, she runs Illinois' free legal answers and she devotes 20 hours a week to the project, but that they have a little bit higher question volume than Massachusetts. They average about 225 client questions a month. Um, we have a couple other questions here. I do want to note before we turn it over, I did um, enter into the chat box for folks. If you want to share other mobile tools that people it, that you like to use, please go ahead and share those in. Um, I know that there's been a lot of movement in our community. For example, a lot of the uh, forms projects are moving to be more uh, to be more mobile um, optimized as well. So um, a lot of great movement. One of the other questions that we have um, here is what kind of startup cost does setting up a website like this for pro bono volunteers cost? It's good to give a range. Also, what kind of ongoing cost does it require annually? I can give a, just a rough idea of that. Um, I'm, with Pro Bono Net, uh, you know, generally in the past we've packaged together the Pro Bono or Advocate site and the uh, public facing site. Um, and, and the pricing is dependent on generally the size of, of the state um, because the model has been, you know, state partnerships. Um, I mean, I think the, the total startup, uh, and this is this is really rough because, it, like I said, there's a lot of variables, but it's probably around twenty thousand um, to to get started from completely from scratch. Um, as far as ongoing, that's another one of those things where it depends on the uh, the size of the, the user base because we are a nonprofit and we're we're trying to uh, to scale the costs for our partners based on the impact. Uh, that, that our sites can have in, in their particular jurisdictions. So that can really vary widely because it's not, the annual costs are not so much about, you know, developing, you know, the software piece of it. It's kind of the ongoing administrative and, uh, and infrastructure costs. So, I mean, that can range, uh, I want to say, you know, five to ten maybe annually. Um, but it, like I said, there's just a lot of variables uh, around that. So um, certainly, you know, if you're interested in talking about it and getting more details, you know, certainly uh, follow up with us after. And, that, and that's just not just the um, 
like the tech component, but also guiding folks through um, the content strategy, the the different pieces that help to make um, make uh, going through best practices, et cetera, that help to make um, something like this successful. Yeah, and Jillian, that kind of goes to Laura's question uh, about what, what are some benefits of partnering with a resource like ProBononet instead of creating your organization's own mobile resource, and do you recommend an organization link in or create their own resources? Obviously, Laura, I'm biased, um, <laughs> but uh, Jillian kind of touched a little bit on this that uh, you know, we because we're a nonprofit and you know, we focus a lot on uh, on the network piece of it and the impact piece um, because we're a mission-driven organization. Uh, you know, the technology is important, uh, and you know, we we do handle the technology development and the infrastructure, uh, the maintenance, the uh, bug fixing, and uh, we also distribute enhancements across the network. So if uh, like in a project like the TIGs that we've done with Minnesota and Massachusetts, uh, once those are all completed, those and they're actually already beginning to be distributed out to the entire network uh, free of charge. So uh, that model, I think there's a great advantage to being part of that model. Um, you know, and it's not just technological, it's also in terms of the expertise um, because the folks that Pro Bono Net hires have a lot of uh, background in legal services um, I'm actually a lawyer by training and a techie because I think it's a hell of a lot of fun. But um, you know, I'm really interested in using technology to, you know, to increase access to justice. So uh, that's what got me into this and why I'm excited to develop the technology to support your work. So that's, I mean, I think that's, a, you know, I'm obviously making a sales pitch here, and I, but I think it's, I think there's a really important piece to that. Um, because it means that we we're really partnering with you. We're not just selling you a product. So, um, you know, it, I think there there are some advantages to creating your own if you have the the expertise and the um, the financial support to do it. Um, it because you have total control uh, over over the the platform that you end up developing. But um, I think it's there are a lot of advantages to going with a network that's established and has tools that have been specifically built for uh, to support your community, uh, particularly in this era now where it's not enough just to have a website, right? I mean, you, you have to have support for mobile. You have to have support for multimedia. Um, increasingly, you know, we're starting to think about how AI, uh, artificial intelligence, comes into play. Uh, with our platform, and, and we're starting to look at, you know, how can we integrate that uh, into, you know, not just the front-end experience, but also to make the work easier for the organizations that are supporting the content uh, on the site. So, you know, end of sales pitch, but uh, I think I think there there are some pretty important advantages to it. Um, uh, just to add on to that a little bit. Um, if you end up developing your own, make sure you go with something that is community supported, that has the yeah. developers behind it. Um, in Washington State, we replicated the Tennessee, went with the original Tennessee code, and then we're stuck with a program that had a single coder that really didn't want to continue on that, and we're reevaluating whether to go to a Drupal-based platform or to ABA Free Legal Answers. The dev time really added up and ate into our budget. So making sure you've got a community based um, and people working on it will help you stem those costs and share the costs amongst the entire community. Yeah, the sustainability question is extremely important with these projects. Uh, getting the site, you know, standing up the site is one thing and it's a great accomplishment, but uh, keeping it up to date, keeping the content fresh, uh, making sure that you can adapt to new technologies that requires an ongoing commitment and having that community support is really important. Great, so um, I'll pause here to see if there's any other questions or comments. These have been really great uh, questions. Um, and uh, I wanted to also, um, while we're waiting for that, thank our presenters for 
um, our panelists for such a great uh, presentation. I, I learned some new things today. And thanks also to Sart and Ket at LSN TAP for partnering with this with us on this presentation. Um, I'm just pausing here to see um, if there's any questions. Sart, any closing uh, comments as well from your perspective? Um, for I just like to remind people that this there's a lot of interest in there's a lot of growing capability. Um, I think Mike's final comments there about how do we add AI, how do we add video, how do we make this a more rich experience um, that provides more things than a traditional clinic would is really the future of where this is going, and I'm excited to see that over the next uh, year or two.